So right as I was leaving for vacation for the holidays, I had a package and it was Iron Sworn Star Forged, the physical version of this game with the asset deck and the reference guide. I did a video on the game, which was a page through of the digital version. And if you're interested, you can see that video up here and I'll try to remember to put it in the link below as well. What this video is going to do is, so basically what I did, let me just tell you what I did. I was super excited to receive it, grabbed it on the way out, and I took it with me in a bag when I was on vacation and started playing it. I grabbed some dice and I was all set to go. This video is going to walk you through how I developed my story, how I began my gameplay, and in so doing, it will take you through the physical version of the book so you can see what you get as we look here at the credits for the game, as well as a light discussion of the game mechanics. But this is not a video so much about the mechanics of the game because I think they are going to shine as we discuss how you build a story in the game how you set out to play what is essentially really interactive fiction that becomes a give and take between you as the storyteller and the books and other materials here, in this case, the cards that support your story. But I think more so than any solo designed RPG that I can think of, what you get with Starforged is that foundation for just telling a story using RPG mechanics and developing and supporting your story with that. So there are different modes of play for Starforged and for Iron Sworn. There's the guided play, which is a traditional sort of GM or storyteller and person or persons. There's co-op where you can play with a group of friends together. And I have not done this yet. It's something I really, really want to do because I think that it would be phenomenal to do this with Starforged or uh, Iron, Iron Sworn itself. And then there is solo. And that's what I'm going to explore here with you in this video as you can see how I developed my own game. What you need to play is the, you need some dice, you need, you do need the asset cards for this game, and I believe they're available as uh, printed play as well as the physical copy here that I have, and these cards here are my character cards, we'll get to that. And you do need reference sheets and worksheets, well, it says you need them, you'll see that I did not use the pre-printed reference sheets and I didn't do that because I like to have my character sheet in the same notebook and we'll we will get to that. The material is presented to walk you through the creation of your world starting from essentially like the biggest to the most local area and if you're familiar at all with the game you know that a core concept of the game is that you, your character, has set forth an iron vow to something that is driving your story, that is the overarching goal for your game. And what you do in the context of your story as you develop it are different, we'll call them adventures or subsets of fulfilling that vow and we'll see how I do that in my game. The characters have stats, edge, heart, iron, shadow, and wits, and they also have assets and this is where the cards come in. So your character is a combination of the stats that you have and the assets that you have. The assets include a starship for this game. They include two paths that you go on that are essentially background motivators for your character. And we'll see that I chose to play a courier and a scavenger. And then you also get a companion option. 
in my case, I actually chose two companions, and that's a little outside of the rules that represents a kind of leveled up character, but I felt that I wanted to have both a glow cat companion and a utility bot, and we'll see why as we get into this. But as I said, in terms of this video, I'm really going to be talking about how I developed my story and therefore skipping over some of the explanation of the rules, beyond which to say that you are rolling dice to determine whether you have successfully done something in a very strong way, whether you have sort of succeeded at something, or whether you've really failed at something. And that is the biggest overview of the mechanic that you need, I think. There are a lot of charts and tables to guide you when you succeed or fail, as well as to just build out the context, the environment for the story. And again, we will get to it. The rest of the mechanics, such as burning momentum that we're seeing here and progress tracks, we'll discuss as we go a little bit. They're not really essential to understand how this rule set works to foster a story. So at the outset, what you are doing when you get your book is you're following the directions that are here and they're presented as a series of exercises to create your world. And it is written very much in that format. They're, they're even called exercises, and there's a sort of a time frame given. And there are some default assumptions about the world that you're in, that it's perilous and lonely and unexplored, and not necessarily just, but that there is hope there. To start the game, to start your story, you are going to be making your way through 14 larger categories. They're called truth categories that help define key aspects of your setting. Now, when I was opting to do this, I did everything pretty much randomly. So what I've done here for the video is you can see, hopefully it shows up. I'm not sure super how clear this is. When I was doing something that was actually in the rules, I wrote it in pen, in ink, in blue ink in most cases. When I was making a note or doing something that was just suggested to me by my own imagination based on what I had done in the rules, I wrote it in pencil. So you can kind of see how I begin to develop the story based on the rules that I was doing. And as I said, I did my roles randomly. I allowed myself to think about what the random roles would suggest in terms of a story. So the very first thing that I did, oh, and it, I will say this, the tips for managing this exercise are important, especially this leaving unanswered questions, because it's telling you not to get too much into the details. I also, as you'll see, decided to skip some of the 14 background truth categories to come back to later, to flesh out later as I had more specifics about my own story to make sure that they would kind of knit together or they could be returned to to bring me forward in the story. So the first thing that I rolled on in terms of the cataclysm was that the essentially the kind of beginning of this universe, the beginning of this world, was that we were escaping the ravages of a catastrophic war. And furthermore, that we had been attacked by artificial intelligence as the kind of inciting incident for us traveling around and seeking some type of resolution. There is a note here that says, do you possess a keepsake or artifact of pre-cataclysm society? What is it? Why is it important to you? Now, I will say that for all the amazing charts and random tables in this material, I don't think there is one uh, like a kind of a trinket thing. So I just wrote a note here with a question mark because I wanted to potentially go back to something maybe outside of Iron Sworn to give myself a trinket. As you know, if you follow the channel, I really like trinkets. I decided that magic existed, but I'm not really going to develop that more here. And I was along the way rolling on the some of these spark tables. There are core oracle 
sort of spark table. So there's an action and a theme one, and there is a descriptor and a focus one. I rolled on these along the way to give myself some narrative direction. So here, right after the cataclysm, I rolled aid memory, in initiate balance and prominent people, just to start to have me think about what might be happening in this world. When I got to the section on communication and data, I rolled up that um, information is life. We rely on couriers to transport messages and data. And then I rolled on research expedition and shrouded connection. And the courier is going to swear a vow to convey information. So this was kind of giving me the sense that maybe I would be a courier. And in Ironsworn, Starforged, you are putting together your environment before the character in a very, um, in a way that I do and am a proponent of on my channel. I also rolled up that AI still exists and it can be a companion and it can be peaceful. And again, this came from the random generators here for the world. So that caused me to think when putting all of this together about balance and some sort of connections and helping memory or helping something in the past that perhaps, and this is where I went to pencil to show you that something went wrong in the world. There was a, maybe there was a software virus or a miscommunication and it turned the peaceful AI, because it also, I got the contradiction here, attacked by AI, but peaceful AI, that the, that that was the site of something going wrong, that that is a story point, that what, what happened, why did the AI turn from being peaceful to attacking us? The notion of a courier and communication being important that perhaps we are a, we have a message to bring somewhere or something. Then I moved on to, I skipped over medicine and I also skipped over the AI details itself because again, I may want to develop that later to the war section and I rolled up that the resources are too precious to support organized fighting or advanced weaponry, that weapons are simple and cheap. So this told me that perhaps the technology level here is low and again that somehow that is going to tie into the question of the AI turning from peaceful to antagonistic. Then I went to the section on, I skipped over again, life forms, precursors. I can come back to this. I did roll on the horrors that um, I came up with the fact that there are some ghost ships around. I'm not sure that's going to come into play. And then I went to create my character. And the one of the main things to do in creating your character is to decide on two paths that they will be taking. And those are, in effect, backgrounds. And I'm going to show you just some of them here so you can see. These are the ones, effectively, that I did not choose because I... So you could be an ace or an archer or armored. And I'll just pause on these if you want to read some of them. I love the fact that there's an artist path, augmented, banner sworn, blade master. And as you can see, there are just a mercenary. There are so, so many of them, an outcast. I chose mine not randomly. I chose mine at this point to match the story that I was developing, which I decided I was going to be, first of all, a courier so that I was somebody that was going to gain benefits when I traveled between places or carried a message or something like that. And I also decided that I was a scavenger, that um, as you'll see, the I am somewhat of an outcast and therefore somebody who needs to scavenge around to maybe get supplies or information or items or even the message itself. We don't know. And then this is where I got to really developing my story. So I rolled on the 
one of these two oracle tables again, and I got Reveal Greed. And that led me to create this story that my character left their homeland when they discovered that people's motivations or that of their own family was not as benevolent as they had thought. Because there was something about this that I was feeling like I was an outcast from my family and that my family somehow was connected to this AI that went bad, that perhaps we were the owner of a corporation that made it or something like that. I am the outcast heir to a formally thought benevolent ruler, someone trying to protect the AI life forms that have been invented. But I discovered my family was doing ill or doing badly, and that I have a vow to make up for that, so that my vow is to restore the benevolent leadership to the Aurora Corporation. And I just rolled that up from a random table. So that the character is coming into focus now that I am my my background as a scavenger and a courier is an outlaw in some way, and that I am it, I'm feeling that the people a lot of the people that I'm interacting with or that I'm going to be taking messages from are members of my family that are perhaps estranged from one another. Perhaps there are factions within my own family that is part of this larger corporation that is trying to control things, something along those lines. Then I rolled up focus relationship and I decided from that that um, I need to perhaps destroy one of my siblings who was falsely installed um, in, in power. And then we took the basic, we went continued on the character creation to just take our basic command vehicle, which frankly, I'm probably not going to do a lot with utilizing the space travel moves, but I got it anyway. And then under the starship, though, there is a table that you roll on that uh, says, that explains to you where you got that starship from. And I rolled up that... I inherited it from a relative or mentor, and I decided to go with relative and decided that I have a rich cousin who's still on the inside who is helping me, that I have a connection somehow to this cousin, that the cousin got me the starship to travel around, so sort of on the DL from the inside to help me with what I'm trying to do, with what we're trying to do. Maybe we're the younger generation of this family who's trying to do right by the AI that was done wrong by our family. And so I started making a list here of some things that I would do. And the the first, well, one of the things is to, to sort of meet up with this cousin and figure out who they are. And there are bigger things to do, like infiltrate the family somehow. Okay, this obviously got a little smudged here. Um, perhaps finding the AI that there's like maybe a, maybe there's like a central AI that is still programmed in a peaceful way that I need to find and bring to someone, maybe my cousin, maybe someone else who can fix it or who can restore it. So I've done all of this before I've even did my stats. And then I get to my stats and I have decided what stats I want based on the assignment of the number array that you can do two ones, two twos, and a three. And essentially what you are doing to play this game is to roll three dice, two d10s, and a d6. The d6 is the die that you add on your stat value to. And for a success, for a strong success, you are attempting to exceed both numbers on the d10 with this value. So for example, in this case, if I was doing a move is what it's called with my wits and I rolled a six, I would add six plus three, this would be a nine. And if this was my d10 roll, this would be a weak success because this nine matches this nine. It exceeds one of the values, but it doesn't exceed both of the values. If I had rolled this on a roll 
regardless of whatever I was working with here, it would be a strong hit because it succeeds both of these numbers. And if I roll something like this, that is lower than both of those numbers, if the final value of this was four, then it would be a strong fail. And so as you go through the story that you're developing, you decide based on what the fiction is telling you, what your story is telling you, what type of move you want to do, what that means in terms of what stat you're using, and then based on the strong success, the average success, or a fail, what the outcome will be. So I gave myself stats that um, made sense to me with my character, and I am making a note here of that I swore an iron vow on a corrupted piece of AI code etched into pure silver, representing where it all went wrong. That part of this game, the concept behind the emotion of the game is to find an item, and I came up with this by rolling on some tables here, that you're swearing your vow on. And my mission, my goal now is to, in a sense, avenge the the wronged AI, but also there is going to be something I will uncover about the fact that I was cast out by my own family and that this AI is controlled by my family that is like this major, basically that represents this major corporation that is operating to now take the corrupted AI and do something bad with it. And to round all this out, we give our character a name. In my case, I rolled up the name Echo as the call sign for my character. And we will gear up, meaning we just automatically kind of get what we need, which is great. I love I love games that explicitly give you the permission to just kind of abstract these things. So there's a suggestion here of what's in our spacer kit, but basically we have the equipment that we need. Then we start to build a starting sector. So we've gone from the, the general kind of galactic meta environment of wars and magic and religion to our specific character. And now we're coming back out to detail where our character is in the sector of space. There are sector worksheets as well as connection worksheets, meaning connections to NPCs that you may meet. As I mentioned at the outset of the video, I'm not using them. I think they're actually extremely useful to a uh, player, but I did not make use of them for this, for the purpose of this video, because I wanted to keep it all, as I said, in one notebook to refer back to it. And basically what I did was I followed the exercises and rolled on the random tables to determine, first of all, what type of area, the starting region we were in, was it a terminus or the outlands or the expanse? And I got, it was a terminus, which meant that basically it's relatively common, commonly settled. And it says, if you want to focus on interacting with other people and communities, start here. So actually, I take that back. I didn't roll on that. I chose to start at the terminus with four settlements. And I only ended up developing really one to two settlements because I'm going to come back as my story evolves and build out the other settlements. The first settlement that I made was called Wayward. It's an orbital settlement and it has hundreds of people. It's a precarious location. And then I rolled up again, all from the tables in the book that People live here with a sort of tolerant authority. There's some settlement projects that are going on, and I rolled up agriculture and defense as those projects. Now, here's where I started abstracting my own story from it. And I said that the most harmonious settlements in this world are those that have simple projects such as agriculture, and then they have other projects such as defense to protect the simple ones. Because again, in my world, in this world, in Echo's world, there was a simpler time before the 
AI was corrupted, where AI and humans lived peacefully. And this is represented in my story by my companion utility bot that I chose at the outset, that this utility bot is really almost like a an AI familiar that I have in addition to my glow cat, who's another familiar. So the settlement here is representative of the strife that there is between maintaining peace and a calm time with very simple work and the defense that is necessary to protect that. This is an orbital settlement. And then I rolled up the world that it is circling. It's Imbrium. It's a rocky world with towering plateaus and massive impact craters scarred by the destruction. There's massive dust dunes and there are some towering rocky spires and asteroid impacts. And then I abstracted from this to say that my wayward settlement was made on a chunk of rich earth that had been dislodged from this original star by an asteroid strike. Now, I rolled up that um, Imbrium itself is extinct of life, and then I made a note to myself, but maybe there are some survivors here. Perhaps they're hidden in one of these settlement caves. Just something that perhaps I could go back to if my story dictated that. And I continued with my story, saying once there was an asteroid and it got very cold and the asteroid froze, and magic perhaps was captured in the freezing to make the star, because I rolled up through the table that it is a blazing blue star. And I had said that there was some type of, I called magic in the world as yet to be determined what it is. Perhaps somehow it is captured in the star. Again, that's just a, a little hook that I may come back to and develop, or I may just let go by the wayside. There are tables to roll up for perils and opportunities. And through my random roll for the spaceborne peril, I got familiar foe appears or sends an ominous message and the opportunity, a cache of cargo or supplies. So combining these things together, I come back to the familiar foe being somehow my family that I am cast out of. I'm still looking for this connection to my cousin or something that's going to be my first first thing that I'm going to be doing is trying to find my cousin here. And the opportunity, it says a cache of cargo or supplies. Well, I'm that to me means some type of perhaps not a literal cache, but a cache of information or something. Maybe it's Maybe it is tools or implements or something that my cousin has that I need to get from them and then perhaps take somewhere as part of this larger project to uncover the corruption and to save the AIs or to rather uh, more to restore the AIs to their peaceful state. So then I went to the NPC connection that I have on Wayward. I decided this is my cousin and I rolled up her name, Talia Frost, again from the random tables and all random. Her role, she's an explorer or an engineer. Her goal is to craft objects and an aspect of her is that she is brave. I abstracted from this that I need to, to find her and to get some kind of instructions from her. Because she is a crafter and an engineer, and she is my ally, I have abstracted that she has been kind of working on the inside of the family corporation to restore this corrupted software or something. And my iron vow for this dangerous mission is to, to find her and to get some instructions or something from her. Then I rolled up this, two seemingly unrelated problems are shown to be connected. So there are something that I will discover as I play out the story that this one path I'm on, this mission to get something that will restore the AI to its harmonious state is going to be perhaps connected to something else that I don't yet know what that is. So I've got a lot of questions out there, a lot of narrative strands I could pick up. But to sum up now, my story begins that we've arrived at Talia's workplace. 
which is a derelict engineering module in a seedy area of Erebus. She works for an underground community trying to help those who live uh, at the subsistence level, at the subsistence level. We're going to arrive there and then we ask, we face a a danger or a threat to see if we can find Talia. We got a strong hit. We got plus one momentum on that. And we're told our way to Talia. So we're going to be able to see her. And then we roll on asking the Oracle whether when we see her, is she happy to see us? And we got a definitely not. And the question we ask then is why? And we pay the price for this strong answer. And the answer is that something of value is lost or destroyed. So basically she turns to us and tells us this twist, this negative twist in our story. We've reached her and we think she's basically just going to hand over this software, this component part that we need and give us direction as to where to take it. And instead she's telling us that it has been lost, possibly destroyed. And our new task, our new mission is to find it and bring it back to her so that she can work on it and recraft it and send us to the place we need to go to bring it. So you can see now I have a ton of different tasks to do. At this point, I could go to one of the tables in the, the book to figure out where I'm going to be traveling. And I could do like essentially a dungeon delve to try to find something. I just want to show you and I'm going to end I'm going to end the story here and just kind of show you some of the tables and charts that are available to develop it because this is where I'm going to go next that I'm going to say that I'm going into a, a derelict zone to try to recover this thing that that the twist was that Talia had it and now she doesn't and you could roll up you could do a random roll that it is some type of perhaps it's an engine in an engineering settlement and then you get features of the what is there what perils and opportunities there are all these kinds of tables key to various types of environments or zones. And you can rely on these to build your story and to move back and forth between doing specific rolls of the dice and interacting with the tables to flesh out the physical environment, for example. There is a chart here that I just showed earlier on about how to build creatures. If you want to create a creature that you will interact with, you have the choice of the size of the creature that it could be if you're finding it on an interior land, liquid or air, and various aspects that it would have and what it looks like, what it reveals itself to be, what its behavior is. And from that, you will create something that makes sense to your story. And then lastly, I want to go back in a sort of perhaps counterintuitive way, just to look a little bit at what the actual moves of the game are. What are the kinds of things that you do before sit to roll the dice? And the reason that I'm looking at this last is because I do feel so strongly, as I said at the outset, that what you have here in Starforged is really a, a manual for interactive storytelling as opposed to being something that is mechanics forward first. So the moves are the mechanics, and you can see that they are divided into various types. So the session moves, the bigger types of moves come when you start a session or for example, when you want to take a break or end a session. And then there are adventure moves, things that you would do to, for example, gather information and you will roll your dice and then you will get some little information about how to interpret the role of your dice. And you will fit your interpretation into the fiction, into the story that you already have. 
We already looked at, for example, the swearing of the iron vow. If you're searching for making a connection, for example, or let's say we wanted to test our relationship, that with Talia, we could have built out that interaction where we got the strong negative hit where I interpreted that she lost or no longer had what we thought she had. Did this impact our relationship or how did it impact our relationship? We could have done a test on that. And then based on the role that we got, we would envision how this impacts the story. And this is the way that these moves are factored in and the way they interact with the development of your story. And then sometimes you get a table to roll on that will tell you what happens if you try to make a discovery, for example, or confront chaos. Of course, there's combat and there are various combat moves that you can make upon the beginning of combat or during a defensive move or trying to strike out in combat. And then there are penalty moves. What happens when you are getting a hit or your companion gets a hit or you run out of resources. And again, you can see each of these is a block of text that will explain to you or give you some suggestion as to how to interpret the outcome of the dice in the context of your story. And at the end of the day, that's what the dice are doing in this game, that they are there to direct you to change or impact your story in some manner. So that is a look inside Ironsworn, Ironsworn Starforged, and it is a, an exemplary storytelling tool, especially for the soloist wanting to do sci-fi where there is, I think, a dearth of materials out there. There are definitely some, so that's a look inside Ironsworn Starforged. It is for the solo sci-fi and I would say for cooperative story development, an exemplary resource to create all sorts of interactive fiction that is as limitless as your own imagination.